topology and cohomology of manifolds. Do I have any good chat? Sorry. I have some in my office. Looks okay. Keep pushing. But first, let me tell you about locally finite homology and uh, cohomology with compact supports. So we consider, so X is going to be a locally compact space. Consider the singular locally finite complex for X, what I'm going to define. So the end chains, so the group of end chains are all uh, formal linear combinations. Which goes from the 
locally finite singular in chains to the locally finite singular in one chains is take the boundary in the usual sense. So for each simplex in this linear combination, you'll end up with n plus 1 of its faces all multiplied by the plus or minus the same coefficient. And since the simplex has only finitely many faces, if you ask how many of those can meet a given compact set, the answer is at most all the faces of all the simplices that meet that. So that's only finitely many. Okay. Is every sum finite here? All right. Is every sum, is every n chain a finite sum or? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, that's so the whole point. point. They're, they're formal infinite linear combinations. So it can be uncountable. Yeah, it can be uncountable. We take uncountably many copies of R2 and then take in each one what I just had here. We mostly think about for reasonable spaces like a connected manifold, uh, second countable spaces, uh, these sums have to be countable. I mean, only finitely many, not countable. The non zero coefficients. But in general, it would be a And of course, as all of these boundaries were, you can calculate them. So you've got the homology, which is the locally finite homology of the space. Now, I'm not going to prove this, but here's an exercise for you. Calculate the locally finite homology Anybody want to guess what the answer is? C in dimension n, zero. Sorry? It's supported in dimension n. Okay. So it's zero if star is not equal to n. And what is it for star equal to n? C. D for star equal to n. And this thing I wrote down for the plane would be an example, well, certainly an example of an n cycle, locally finite n cycle, and then it's a generator. So that's an exercise for you. This is another way to define the locally finite chains and hence the locally finite homology. Uh, and I'll do this, say, in the second countable case. So suppose we have uh, a collection of, well, no, I'll do it this way. Let's consider the singular chains on space X modulo X minus a compact subset. So here, X is our space. K and S is compact. I'm still sticking with locally compact space. Okay. So these are simply all the singular chains in X modulo those that come from X minus K. Okay. Well, if K prime, if K is contained in K prime, then X minus K prime is contained in x minus k. So in this case, you would get the singular chains uh, in, as it goes, x, uh, x minus k prime map to the singular chains of x, x minus k. This is a bigger set than this, and therefore what you're dividing out by here is bigger than what you're dividing out by here, so this is a quotient. 
So you can now form an inverse limit over the compact set. So you can get the inverse of projective limit over the compact subsets of X of the singular chains. Well, the singular chain is X, X minus K. And that is exactly the locally finite chains. If you have a locally finite chain, then for any compact set, there are only finitely many of uh, the simplices in the chain that are outside that meet the compact set. All the rest of the simplices lie in x minus k. And therefore, when you move into this quotient, you only see finitely many of the simplices that go non-trivially. So you get a finite linear combination over here. So, if, to say that again, if summation lambda sigma sigma is a locally finite chain, then all but finite many of the sigma, so let's take this so that none of the coefficients are zero, uh, finite many of the sigma meet k, no, sorry. Only, only finite many of the sigma be k, and hence, right, and the rest lie in x minus k. So, under the obvious math. There are only finitely many of these terms that are not simplices in here, and therefore you've got a ordinary element in the singular complex. And this is clearly compatible if I have k contained in k prime and a linear combination, the locally finite chain, if I project it into singular uh, x comma x minus k and also into singular of uh, x x minus k prime then then where did I, which one did I so this is smaller than this this diagram so here, you're taking all the simplices, the finite number of simplices <coughs> uh, that don't be k prime, taking that linear combination, whatever it is in here. And here, you're only taking the ones that don't meet k, but any one that doesn't meet k prime doesn't meet k, so all of the ones, sorry. Right. K, k prime is bigger. K, yeah. K prime is bigger. So if it doesn't meet K prime, it doesn't meet. So, so here I'm throwing away the ones that don't meet K prime. Mm -hmm. I'm just ignoring them. Here I'm ignoring the ones that don't meet K. So I don't quite have the same answers. But if I ignore the ones that don't meet k prime, they certainly don't meet k. The finitely many that do meet k prime, some of those may meet k, others may not. But it doesn't matter whether or not I keep them, because if they don't meet k, they go to zero here. So I get the same answer. I get simply the image of all of those that don't, not sorry, that meet K. I didn't explain that very clearly, but it should be obvious. 
So you get a well-defined image in, for every compact set, and they're all compatible under these inclusion maps of pairs. So that's what an element in the inverse limit is. So we define the map from the locally finite singular chain to the projective limit. And now it's not too hard to show that, in fact, this is an isomorphism. But certainly, this map is injective. If you have a non-trivial linear combination here, then look at one of its simplest cities, find a compact set that contains the image, and then in that term, use that as k, look at that particular term, that simplex will be non-trivial, and there may be others too, but at least you get a non-zero element here. So that shows you that every element here has an image in one of the factors that's non-trivial, so this map is injected. And now we just use a proof that's a nice simple proof. Okay. Now there's a cohomological analog of this. People have probably seen it's a little more common. Oh, by the way, this, this homology theory has another name. It's called Borel Moore homology. As well as locally finite homology. So the analog in cohomology is cohomology with compact supports. Again, I'll do it at the singular level. Let's look at the singular co-chain. Yeah, singular co-chain on X. And we're going to define a sub-chain complex. Those that have compact support. It's not a dual of this. Well, there is a duality. We're coming to that. Um, In some sense, it, some sense it's the dual, but uh, that has to be appropriately interpreted. So we say a uh, singular co-chain has compact support. So alpha is in here. If, so alpha is in here. If and only if there exists a compact set okay, of alpha, depending on alpha, such that Uh, alpha evaluated on a singular simplex is zero unless image of sigma contained in this compact set. So there has to be a compact set so that the only singular simplices of which this co-chain is always not trivially on are those whose image lies in that compact set. And of course the compact set can vary because you vary alpha. There's not one fixed compact set. Yeah. I just want to confirm. So this map of singular complexes is really a map of complexes, not just a, a group. Yes. And yeah. that one. So we get a map, we get a complex in the inverse limit. Yeah, and this map is also map. Yeah, I should have said that this map of complexes. Compact set such that alpha evaluates on sigma is zero if image of sigma 
is contained in x minus k of x. So there are three kinds of, of simplicities we have to think about. There are those in the compact set, there are those strictly outside the compact set, and there are those that meet both the compact set and the outside. And what I said first was not correct. So um, this only vanishes, this cochain only vanishes outside the compact set. It vanishes for any simplex, singular simplex whose image is completely outside the compact set. But for those that span, it can be non trivial. Okay, so first thing to check is that if alpha has compact support, then so does its co boundary. Because if you take an n plus 1 simplex, so suppose k alpha is the compact set for alpha. I claim k alpha is also an appropriate compact set for the co boundary. This I mean, if K alpha is a, a, the compact set that satisfies this condition for alpha, then it also satisfies this condition. Same set satisfies this condition for coboundary alpha. Because if you have an n plus one simplex mapping into X and missing K alpha, then all its Faces this k alpha, and therefore alpha evaluates zero on every one of these faces, and therefore the linear combination for the boundary will vanish on this thing. If I had taken the other one, the one I first wrote down, it wouldn't be closed under co-boundary because that is simplex like this. Well, alpha would vanish on it because it's under the first definition, not the second, because the simplex isn't. Sorry. Because the simplex isn't contained in the complex set. But when I take its boundary, two of the three are not contained in the complex set, so uh, alpha would vanish there but it could be not zero here. So the other choice doesn't give a subcompact. Right? You understand this? Okay, so that's cochains with compact support. It's a subcomplex, so you can form the cohomology with compact support. What is the cohomology of compact support of Rn? Isomorphic to the first case. Sorry? Isomorphic to the. Right, it's the same answer. Zero star I equals n. Z star Suppose more generally you had any, suppose I start with a compact manifold with boundary in the bar, compact with boundary. And I let X be the interior of N. What is the cohomology of compact supports of X? Set like this, 
or you simply so the boundary of this manifold has a collar neighborhood. There's an open subset of the manifold which is uh, homeomorphic to the boundary of the bar cross zero one, where the boundary is the zero end. Right? So we can get compact subsets by taking and let so let's write n as the union of w, which is a compact set. Union is collar. This is just as, I mean, these are disjoint sets, but of course the topology is the disjoint union topology. And I can get compact sets by taking w union boundary m bar cross epsilon 1. So go out to within epsilon of the boundary in this color neighborhood. That's, and everything in here is a compact set. What is w? w is a complement of this color. So the compact manifold with boundary, we take a collar around the boundary and take it away. We just have another copy of the compact manifold. It's just we shrunk it in slightly. Still compact. So that's a W, and then I thicken that collar up a little bit. So good compact set. I mean, just think about this for the interval. So the interval is a compact manifold with boundary. Well, what are you trying to prove? I'm no. trying to compute, oh. I'm trying to help you compute the, the cohomology with compact supports. So I'm first saying, I don't have to think about all compact sets. I can just restrict my attention to compact sets like this because they're co-filing the set of compact sets in the interior. Every compact set is contained in one like this. So I might as well, so I can always take my, for any alpha, there's a K alpha of this form. Any alpha with compact supports is a K alpha of this form. So I might as well take these compact sets, let's call them K of T, zero less than T less than or equal to a half. So KT would be KT is W union the collar from one half to one. I'm yeah, sorry, from T to one. Now let T go to zero. So that's a family of compact sets, and for every alpha, we're given alpha or alpha, a singular coaching with compact supports, we can take K alpha equal KT or some T Because there's a compact set K alpha in here and all such compact sets are contained in these particular families that go right up to the boundary. So we might as well compute the cohomology of these KP on the boundary KP. And then take the limit. But these all have the same cohomology, and the inclusions are isomorphisms, and these are, of course, the cohomology of the manifold. Why is it continuous at zero? Why is what? Why is it continuous then? Oh, well, it's by definition of the. Yeah, you just have. These compact sets get bigger and bigger and bigger, but the inclusions give you isomorphisms on cohomology and relative cohomology. So in fact, 
the answer to your question, given a compact manifold with boundary, the relative cohomology, sorry, the cohomology with compact supports of the interior of the end bar is simply the relative cohomology of the end bar by the standard. And there's a natural isomorphism here. Given a cochain with compact supports in the interior, you can extend it by zero to the rest of the space, and you get a relative cochain here. And that's the map to get this. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about the duality between. Well, sorry. So back to the locally finite singular chain complex. If we just take a dual of this and take homology, that's not this, but what's that? You want to take the homology? Yeah, so you take the dual, you, you, and then you get the compact that's going up. Yeah. So that's equal homology. Yeah, this. so that's going to be the same as the compactly supported. But this is covariant, and that thing should be. No. Oh? No. The variances are reversed on both of them. So let me talk about that for a second. So you're used to cohomology being contravariant and homology being covariant. Those variances both are reversed here. So you see if I have A containing B, these are, uh, let's say, open sets. And I look at the cohomology with compact support of A and the cohomology of compact support B, the map goes this way. Because if I have a cycle with compact support on A, I simply extend it by zero to give me a compactly supported co-cycle on B. So the map here is extend by zero. And the locally finite homology, the map goes from the locally finite homology of B to the locally finite homology of A. And this is a slightly interesting map. You have some infinite combination of simplices in B, and A is an open subset of B. Okay. So how are you going to get it? infinite linear combination of simplices mapping into A. Well, so here's A inside B. For the simplices, and I have some linear combination of simplices in B, locally finite. Well, for those simplices that happen to be, whose image happens to lie in A, I simply take them. For those that don't lie, lie completely outside of A, I just ignore them. And what do I do for those that cross the boundary? Well, I take the barycentric subdivision. Are you assuming the boundary of A and B is good? It's very it doesn't matter. I'm not saying anything about what the boundary looks. I'm going to give you a prescription. It's not even a matter of no, no, doesn't have to be. Just open sets. So if you have a simplex that hits both A and the complement of A, you take the barycentric subdivision and throw away any pieces that are completely outside A, keep the pieces that, keep the pieces that still meet A, and if they also go outside, you have to subdivide again. And that's what you do. And you end up with some finer and finer subdivision as you come closer and closer to B. And that's clearly a locally finite yes. chain or cycle. And you also have a map from the homology of A to the local. No, there's no map the other way. 
Can you do it by inclusion? No, because it's not locally finite in B. There'll be compact subsets, or there can be compact subsets in B. I mean, think again about the interval. Here's A, and here's B. So I have some locally finite chain A, like, you know, some division that infinite as you go toward the edges, and now here's this compact set. So there's no, these are contravariant, these have the opposite variance that you're used to, and they don't have the normal variance. So any compact set of UK has to stay a certain distance away from that boundary, so That's right. you don't run into the infinite. That's right. granulation, which is happening at the That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> the compact set, it's at some finite distance, and so you, once your simplices get small enough, they won't go out and meet the. So now these are related. So take the singular, compactly supported singular functions. Insert the locally finite singular homology, or singular chains on that, so it's pairing between these. If you have a compactly supported uh, co chain, and you have a locally finite Compactly supported co chain and locally finite chain. Well, associated with this compactly supported co chain, we have a compact set. And this thing vanishes on all the simplices outside the compact set. On the other hand, this thing only has finitely many simplices that meet the compact set. So when I go to evaluate alpha on this expression, alpha evaluates zero on all but finitely many of the terms. So I get an answer. And that's it depends on the choice of the compact set. Comparing. Sorry? So it depends on the choice of the compact set. No. Uh, no. Because if I choose a bigger, I mean, suppose, suppose I had k alpha and you like the k prime alpha bigger. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I'm doing is, I can say it this way, I am going to evaluate alpha on every one of these simplices and get an integer, and then I'm going to try to take the sum of those integers times these integers. I just need to know that only finitely many of those integers are not zero. Right. And that's what the contract set tells me. Is that right? So by adjointness, we get a map from the singular cochains into the linear maps of the singular chains into Z. I haven't talked about what happens to co-boundary and boundary, but it's the usual. I mean, it's, you know, the co-boundary here is mapped over to the dual of the boundary, here, the algebraic dual of the boundary. And this is pretty clearly injective because if you have a singular cochain with compact supports, it evaluates, if it's non-trivial, it evaluates non-trivial on some simplex. So that simplex is a locally finite chain. It's a finite chain. It's not an isomorphism, though. It, is an isomorphism onto the continuous homomorphism. So remember, this thing is an inverse limit of the singular chains of x comma x minus k, projective limit over k. Well, projective, and we think of these things, these are discrete, but a projective limit is a sub 
naturally a subset of the product. And he gets the product topology. Because it's an infinite product, the product topology is not the discrete topology, even though each of the factors it is. So when you unravel all of that, what that means is the continuous homomorphisms are the ones that are determined by projection onto some term in this product. So you take this element in the project, you take it. The projective sequence, the projective limit, it maps to all of the factors by restriction. The continuous homomorphisms that are those that factor through the map to one of the factors. In other words, you have an infinite chain, locally finite chain, it only matters what it looks like on some compact set. Two infinite chains that have this are equal on some compact set, will go the same place under these homomorphisms. It's clear that these things, because they're compactly supported, have that property, and that's exactly the homomorphisms you get. So you have to put in the topology to get the duality. This doesn't affect the cohomology, though. Sorry, I still don't understand how it doesn't depend on the choice of compact set. The specific value of Z, because if you choose a different compact set, what's in between the two, the simplicities you've included or excluded are, are zero. I mean, the value on those simplicities is zero. So let me just, let me say the way I said it the second time. Just look at this. and see if that expression makes sense. So this is an infinite sum, so it looks like this problem with whether that's an infinite sum of integers, so that's an issue. But I claim that only finitely many of these are times zero. And then it's fine. So the compactly supported code chains are the continuous homomorphisms under the direct limit and the projective limit topology from the locally finite things. So this means the quotient chain compact is a cyclic? It's exact? No. Okay. No, these have non trivial cohomology, both of No, I mean, if you, oh, sorry, if you consider all the home, you, you ah, just take If the, I do all the home. Yeah. And there will be a quotient complex. But well, this is a, all the Hobbes is a, is a bigger complex. Yeah, I don't actually know what that gives you. We say it calculates the same cohomology. The, well, that's, that's right. This, these two have the same relationship that ordinary homology and cohomology have. So, the, I mean, if, say, things are finally generated, the free parts are um, the same, and the torsion shift by a dimension. I don't know what happens if you put, so this thing is not free, it's not a, a free abelian group. So I'm not sure what happens if you take all Oh, you really have to take a continuous problem. All right, so that's our introduction. Now, let's go to manifolds. So, here's an in manifold. Local orientation.
homeomorphic to an open mall in Rn, with the point being the origin. By excision, this homology is then the homology of the open mall mu times mu minus the origin. And by the long exact sequence of the pair, the uh, homology, reduced homology of u is trivial. The reduced homology of this thing is the same as the homology of the sphere. The reduced homology of the sphere is non-trivial, only in dimension n minus 1. So from the exact sequence of the pair, you see that this has one non-trivial homology group. That's in dimension n. So this group is C. And the local orientation is the same thing as choosing one of the two generators of this group. And you can think of it as when you choose a generator, you can map the standard simplex delta n linearly into the Euclidean space so that the origin is in its interior. This is now a relative cycle, clearly. It's boundary emissive x. And if you, it either represents the generator you've chosen or the opposite one. And so you pick the ordering of the vertices or the identification with delta n, so that it gives you the generator that you've chosen, and there's your orientation. You reverse the generator here, you have to reverse the orientation of the simplex. All right. So that's a local orientation for the manifold. So we get, okay. now, the next thing to notice is these local orientations, um, uh, at least locally in the manifold, uh, form a constant system. So uh, a local orientation at x and n determines a local orientation Y and N sufficiently close to that. The point is, if you have a generator, you represent it by a relative cycle. The boundary of that cycle is a finite, the compact set, it misses X. So it misses all the Y sufficiently close to X. And therefore, it's also a relative cycle for M comma M. Y. A cycle for the generator has boundary missing a neighborhood of M and for all Y in that neighborhood. For all Y in that neighborhood. cycle giving me the generator at x, if I move nearby to some y, it's still a relative cycle. My y is still gives the generator. So we have a double cover until the end. Of the orientation double cover. So the, the elements here are x and m and an alpha x generator for h n of m and m. Given the point x in the manifold, there are two choices for this generator. So this is a two to one map. I've just told you how to define the local topology. So I locally have 
two separated sheets, each one mapping them by homeomorphism to the manifold. That's the definition of the double cover. So the orientation cover, if n tilde to n is the trivial cover, trivial two sheet cover, we say n is orientable. So an orientable manifold is one whose orientation cover is a trivial two sheet cover. A choice of section in back to end tilde of this two sheet cover in the case when it's trivial is an orientation. And then the manifold is said to be oriented. So such a section, what is such a section? It's a choice of a local generator for the local cohomology at each point that are consistent in the neighborhoods in this fashion. So it's a consistent family of local orientations all the way around the manifold, which may or may not exist, but exists when the manifold is orientable and such a choice is an orientation. Yeah. So orientable oriented manifolds have a what's called fundamental M is an oriented N manifold. So we've chosen these local limitations. An element alpha in the locally finite homology in degree N of M is a fundamental class for this oriented manifold. If alpha, if for all X in the manifold, the image. Alpha in H N of X uh, M minus X is the chosen distinguished local generator. So if you have a locally finite, we've talked about this before, if you have a locally finite cycle or cohomology class, when you work mod the complement of any compact set, that becomes a finite cycle, and therefore you get a well-defined homology class. The example would be, one example would be Rn with the triangulation that I, or R2 on the plane with the triangulation I put down before. That is a fundamental cycle. It's homology class. It is the fundamental class. Oh, so none of this is a specific smooth manifold, right? No. no. It's much easier to prove all of what I'm about to say in the case of smooth manifolds, but it's true for complementary manifolds. Lemma every one in as a fundamental class. And it's unique. So over here, I just said alpha had to have some property near every point. Well, that determines there is such an alpha, and that determines it. Well, for a topological manifold, you actually do a slightly intricate but kind of deep induction argument. You first prove it for an open ball and
this is not too too difficult. It's a, a standard sort of Meyer Torres argument working from coordinate patches using the fact that um, if you have a compact set and a coordinate patch, in those coordinates you can cover it by round balls, round convex balls. And it's usually denoted. Then as a compact oriented oriented manifold, then this will be an ordinary homology class. For a non-compact manifold, it's gonna have to be a lovely finite class. Because it has to go all the way out to the boundary. I mean all the way out to the edge, so it can't possibly be a finite linear dimensional class. What do you mean when you say round round balls? <clears throat> how, I mean how round? But in the coordinates, actual round balls. Okay. They have the property that uh, intersections are convex. I mean, round isn't so important. It's convex that's important. Is that easy to prove? Yeah, you're Euclidean space. So, you know, you have a compact set. Every point can be covered by okay, an open round okay. ball. And then use convexity. Uh, yeah. It's if we have triangula triangulation, then that gives them. Yeah. If you have, if this manifold happened to be triangulated, you would take the sum of one times every top simplex with the right orientation, the orientation given by the orientation manifold. That would be the local factor. Exactly. I'm going to leave a little early today because. I'm going to catch this 649 train back to the city, so I have about 10 more minutes. Uh, five more minutes. So let me state now point for duality, and then I'll talk about this more next week. Well, first I have to tell you about cap product. We've discussed cup product. Now I want cap product. So instead of writing singular, let me just write C in singular. Okay. So a singular coat chain tends to a singular chain maps to a singular chain. And the formula is it's the it's denoted cap product, and it would be beta cap gamma. So beta is a cochain, gamma is a chain. If this is dimension R and this is dimension S, this is dimension S minus R. Okay, so you remove R of the dimensions from this chain. And the formula is this one. So to determine a chain, I simply have to tell you how every a coach every cochain evaluates on it. So here's the chain I'm trying to describe to you. Here's an arbitrary cochain. Take this formula. And of course it only makes sense when alpha is a dimension. This is supposed to be dimension R minus S. This is dimension S, this is dimension R, so this better be. This is dimension R, this is dimension S, this better be dimension S minus R, or else you get too much. Yeah. So that's the formula for cap product. You can write down in terms of the Whitney uh, approximation to the value of exactly what this is. It's beta evaluated on the back appropriate face times the front. So that's cap product. Now we need the version for locally finite things. So if we have compactly supported code chains and locally finite chains, we end up with ordinary chains. Just like the evaluation homomorphism, it's the same property. 
you have a locally finite chain. So for any compactly supported co-chain, there's a compact set, so that it vanishes outside the compact set. This thing has only finitely many, any locally finite chain has only finitely many elements that meet that compact set. So you can take the appropriate faces, do the caps, cap product, you're only doing a finite cap product, so you end up in the ordinary chain. Why isn't that locally finite on the, on the left, or is that more general? <laughs> on the right. Here. Yeah. Because this thing has got compact. So if I'm going to write down another one where I end up with something locally finite over here. But because the co-chain has compact support, it's concentrated in a compact set, and in that compact set, this thing looks like a finite chain. Then it has a whole bunch of other stuff outside the compact set, but that's irrelevant for capping with this co-chain supported in the compact set. So the special case of cap product is evaluation. So if these have the same dimension, cap product is just evaluation of the cut cycle on the cycle. But we saw that if you evaluate a compactly supported co-cycle on a locally finite cycle, you got an integer, you got an answer. You didn't get an infinite collection of points. You just got a finite collection of points and you added them. All right, well, I guess I didn't get the point for duality. Uh, I will continue here. Maybe I'll pick up here and describe this in a little more detail. Is there what? Algebra or algebra structure. Uh, yeah, you can take a couple products here and co-products. Co 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 well, not on the local finite, but not. 